what could have resulted in the deaths of 129 men and officers aboard the ship in Franklin's lost expedition. The fate of the ship remains a topic of investigation, still intriguing to some international researchers of today. Sir John Franklin and his crew set sail from England in 1845 in search of the Northwest Passage, a sea route that was rumored to connect the continents of Europe and Asia. Two ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, headed the expedition. Franklin's wife, Lady Jane Franklin, had become worried after three years without any communication from the expedition. She then persuaded the government to begin investigating. The sites of the three first search efforts were Lancaster Sound, the Bering Strait and overland beginning at the Mackenzie River. All of these searches, as well as others that followed were unsuccessful in discovering the fate of the crew. Lady Franklin began her own search in 1851, but about a year later, these searches led by McClure and Collinson and their crews also turned up missing. Collinson eventually found his way back to England, while McClure was found and returned back in 1854. That same year, Searcher John Ray reported to the Admiralty that according to Inuit information and some discovered items, it seemed that Franklin and the crew had perished. In a desperate last attempt to survive, some may have even taken up cannibalism. Ray was given what would be about $400,000 Canadian dollars. In one recent study, Duffy found that supertesters consume alcoholic beverages, on average, only two to three times a week, compared with five or six times for the average non-testers. Each taste bud, which looks like an onion, consists of 50 to 100 elongated cells running from the top of the bud to the bottom. At the top is a little clump of receptors that capture the taste molecules, known as tastants, in food and drink. The receptors function much like those for sight and smell. Once a bitter signal has been received, it is relayed via proteins known as G-proteins. The G-protein involved in the perception of bitterness, sweetness, and umami was identified in the early 1990s by Linguagen's founder, Robert Margolsky, at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City. Known as gustucin, the protein triggers a cascade of chemical reactions that led to changes in ion concentrations within the cell. Ultimately, this delivers a signal to the brain that registers as bitter. The signaling system is like a bucket brigade, Margolsky says. It goes from the G protein to other proteins. Volunteers in scientific studies sometimes get compensated. The payment can be cash, a gift card, or something almost worthless. It's amazing what people will do for a lollipop when they've had a few drinks. Simon Moore is a professor of public health research at Cardiff University in the UK. And the lollipops were for people who agreed to blow into a breathalyzer. While out on a Friday or Saturday night in Wales more than 1,800 people agreed to the exchange. And the scores covered a wide range of alcohol intake. So that would go from zero upwards. I think one of the largest scores we had was 120, which is near-death experience. The researchers also gave a subset of volunteers a short survey about drinking habits and health risks. Questions like, how drunk are you right now? And, how extreme has your drinking been tonight? And they found that even very drunk respondents felt relatively more sober, if they were surrounded by even drunker people. In other war our perception of intoxication and its risks is relative. So this is the point, as you change context, perceptions will change, although the absolute level of alcohol in their system doesn't change. The study is in the journal BMC Public Health Moore says one way to use this finding is for better city zoning.
In the United Kingdom for example there's been a big push to put more premises that sell alcohol in the same district, in the same area. And what this does is create a concentration of drinkers. So what we might argue from this is, well let's try to break that up a little bit. It always appeared to fly in the face of logic. But now, the biological secrets that allow owls to rotate their heads without cutting off the blood supply have finally been unraveled. Scientists have discovered four major adaptations in owls designed to prevent injury when the animals rotate their overly large heads by up to 270 degrees. The study found that the bird's unique bone structures and vascular systems let them move with increased flexibility. Scientists at John Hopkins University School of Medicine in the U.S. studied snowy, barred and great horned owls after the deaths from natural causes. They found that the vertebral artery enters the neck higher than in other birds, creating more slack. Unlike humans, owls were found to have small vessel connections between the carotid and vertebral arteries, allowing the blood to be exchanged between the two blood vessels. This creates an uninterrupted blood flow to the brain, even if one root is blocked during extreme neck rotation, the adaptation gives the birds a huge range of vision without having to move their bodies and arouse detection by prey. Researchers, scientists and historians have continued to ponder this mystery for over 160 years. What had happened which had caused the men to abandon ship, rather than wait for the ice to melt? The Northwest Passage is well known for its harsh weather and constantly changing sea ice. To the West King William Island, particularly strong gusts of wind howl over layers of thick ice, formed over periods of hundreds of years. How long did the ice trap Franklin's two unfortunate ships so that they could not move? Investigators and researchers continue looking for answers to these questions regarding Franklin's lost expedition, attempting to explain what happened to the captain and his crew. From American explorer Charles Francis Hall in 1860-1863, to Frederick Schwatka in 1879, as well as the Canadian government's search in 1930 and William Gibson's search a year later, some hints were found in the form of human remains, Inuit information and discovered items, but no certain conclusions could be reached. In 1981, along the western coast of King William Island, the University of Alberta-led Franklin Expedition Forensic Anthropology Project dug up human remains. Well, according to the American Psychiatric Association, addiction is a complex condition of the brain where a person has compulsive substance use despite there being harmful consequences. People with addiction tend to have an intense focus on what they're addicted to, to the point where it takes over their life. What makes it so hard to break an addiction is that it can change the way your brain is wired, giving you harsh cravings that make it difficult to stop. 
Studies of brain imaging have even shown changes in areas of the brain that relate to judgment, decision-making, learning, memory, and behavior control. So is this what's happening with Facebook and social media? It's hard to say for sure. That being said, we are starting to give more credit to an addiction that might be pretty similar. Video games. That's because the American Psychiatric Association includes internet gaming disorders as disorders that requires further research, but that can result in clinically significant impairment or distress. The World Health Organization has also added gaming disorders to their international classification of diseases, which is used by medical practitioners around the world to diagnose conditions. Now online video games are obviously not the same as a site like Facebook, yet they do have similar social aspects. It's possible that in the future we'll see health organizations also classifying social media as a type of addiction or disorder. We've all heard the phrase, laughter is the best medicine. But why do we laugh in the first place? It seems that laughing might be a little more hardwired into us than you might think. Infants laugh very early in life, usually learning how to laugh before they can speak. Not only that, but people that are born blind and deaf can still exhibit laughter. One study found that the laughter produced from deaf participants was fundamentally similar to that produced by normally hearing individuals, backing up the idea that laughter is grounded in human biology. It's also been theorized that laughter predates human speech by potentially millions of years, being a simpler form of communication. Laughter is thought to have likely helped earlier people negotiate group dynamics and establish hierarchy. I can't even imagine trying to explain that I'm a little goofball using only laughter. So, if laughter actually is instinctually part of humans, then why do people laugh? It seems like laughter is more of a way for people to better handle stress and make situations feel less threatening than laughter only being about things that we find to be funny. In practice, with a study of 1,200 people that laughed spontaneously in their natural environments, only about 10 to 20 percent of the laughing episodes followed anything the researchers found to be joke-like. Finding something funny still seems to play a part in why we laugh some of the time. While a written word might have multiple definitions, we can usually determine its intended meaning through context. In speech, however, a word can take on additional layers of meaning. Tone of voice, the relationship between speakers, and expectations of where a conversation will go can imbue even words that seem like filler with vital information. Linguists call these filled pauses, which are a kind of hesitation phenomenon. And these seemingly insignificant interruptions are actually quite meaningful in spoken communication. For example, while a silent pause might be interpreted as a sign for others to start speaking, a filled pause can signal that you're not finished yet. Hesitation phenomena can buy time for your speech to catch up with your thoughts, or to fish out the right word for a situation. And they don't just benefit the speaker a filled pause lets your listeners know an important word is on the way. Linguists have even found that people are more likely to remember a word if it comes after a hesitation. Hesitation phenomena aren't the only parts of speech that take on new meaning during dialogue. 
words and phrases such as like, well, or you know, function as discourse markers, ignoring their literal meaning to convey something about the sentence in which they appear. But what exactly happens to your body when you're in a coma? First we have to be clear that comas are very different from sleep. Despite the fact that the origin of the word comes from the Greek for coma, or deep sleep, comas are not sleep however and are instead various forms of unconsciousness that render a person unable to respond to any external stimuli. You can play the loudest, heaviest death metal in the world right next to someone who's comatose, and you won't succeed in doing anything except really annoying the neighbors. Likewise you can even physically hurt people in a coma and they will remain completely oblivious and unresponsive. In times not too distant past, this was sometimes used as treating, with doctors trying to shock their victims back into consciousness. Everything was tried from exposing parts of the body to open flames to severely dropping the body's temperature with ice, to even bloodletting from the head directly. One treatment even included wholly emptying the stomach, we guess because the doctors thought that if a patient got hungry enough, the body would force them to wake up. Or maybe they really were just throwing everything including the kitchen sink at the problem, which was sure was also tried. Comas can occur as a result of serious trauma or as a deliberate medical treatment by doctors. They are typically brought on by traumatic head injury and it's believed that it's the brain's way of shutting down so it can focus on repairing itself. Taste research is a booming business these days, with scientists delving into all five basic sweet, bitter, sour, salty, and umami, the savory taste of protein. Bitterness is of special interest to industry because of its untapped potential in food. There are thousands of bitter-tasting compounds in nature. They defend plants by warning animals away and protect animals by letting them know when a plant may be poisonous. But the system isn't foolproof. Grapefruit and cruciferous vegetable like Brussels sprouts and kale are nutritious despite and sometimes because of their bitter tasting components. Over time, many people have learned to love them, at least in small doses. Humans are the only species that enjoys bitter taste, says Charles Zucker, a neuroscientist at the University of California School of Medicine at San Diego. Every other species is averse to bitter because it means bad news. But we have learned to enjoy it. We drink coffee, which is bitter, and quinine, in tonic water, too. We enjoy having that spice in our lives. Because bitterness can be pleasing in small quantities but repellent when intense, bitter blockers like AMP could make a whole range of foods, drinks, and medicines more palatable and therefore more profitable.